You're just finishing up service. The restaurant is starting to get a little empty. When you stare out the window, you notice a person with their arms outstretched, hopping. And they are hopping towards you. Maybe they've been drinking, even though it's Prohibition era. Maybe they're injured. Maybe they just need your help. But when you look out the window, you also see that their face, it doesn't look like they're quite there. They look like they're just staring at you and their eyes are sort of glazed over. Their skin isn't exactly what you would call alive. It's gray and it doesn't look right. So um, this person is hopping towards you and they don't say anything. Once they've gotten close enough to another person, the chi starts coming out of that other person's body. There's this blue wisp flying out of this other person into the hopping vampire. Hello and welcome to Making a Monster, the weekly podcast where game designers show you their favorite monster, how it works, why it works, and what it means. This week, I'm thrilled for you to meet Banana Chan, one of the designers for a new release called Zhang Shu Blood in the Banquet Hall. She partnered with Wet Ink Games to bring this unique and timely project to Kickstarter. And because I'm future Lucas, I can tell you, Zhang Shu blew past its goals to become fully funded on day one. And it's easy to see why. Her diverse team of authors and designers have crafted a unifying and enlightening cultural experience utterly unique to the medium of tabletop gaming. Zhang Shu Blood in the Banquet Hall is about a Chinese family running a restaurant in the 1920s. And in the daytime, they're faced with oppression and, uh, you know, the stress of having to run a restaurant and keeping up with their customers. Meanwhile, at night, Zhang Shu come out and they attack everyone. Just a big, a quick background on what Zhang Shu are. Yeah, please. They're hopping vampires and they don't feed on blood necessarily. They feed on the chi of a person, the life force of a person, or like, um, uh, quote unquote, the soul of a person. Sen and I, we go back and forth on like the the background of the the Jiangshu as well, because there are a few different stories about like where they came from mythologically, like in mm -hmm. Chinese culture, like how they become things. One of my favorite stories is that this priest, this Taoist priest was trying to carry bodies from point A to point B, trying to drag them along because they had to bury them in the burial site and do like, you know, proper ritual type stuff. And they realized that this is a lot of work. So what they did was they enchanted a bunch of bodies with some paper talismans, and then they started hopping. And they <laughs> started, uh, you know, hopping towards the burial site behind the, the priest. And that was like their easy way of getting out of doing this long chore. Unfortunately, some of the paper talismans fell off their heads. And that's how we have the Jiangshu. They just like run amok and uh, started destroying towns and doing all that fun stuff. How do you feel this story is represented mechanically in the game? So in the game itself, each player has a character sheet that has slots. And when they take damage, they cover up their slots. Slots also have items, facets, skills, their hopes and dreams, things about the character, right? So when they get filled up, they start becoming more and more like Zhang Shu. So it's gradually erasing the parts of the the parts of the character that the player has chosen to define that character's being and personality. Right, exactly. So you could think of it as like, you know, literally turning more and more into Zheng Shu, or, you know, if you're thinking about it in terms of like a, a an allegory, it's like they're becoming more and more assimilated, or they're maybe enacting their fears of becoming assimilated into this new world. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm sold. Uh, <laughs> Tradition and culture figure in the game not just as an object to be protected, but also as a positive force that itself protects the family and the restaurant. And we also have paper talismans. They're fake paper talismans. I'm air quoting right now with my fingers. <laughs> um, but uh, we also have fake paper talismans that characters will write on. So they will come together as a family and write out a family motto, which will keep them safe from the Jiangshu so that when they use the spell when they use these pieces of paper, they can stick them on the junction, they'll freeze them in place, and 
hopefully give them enough time to carry out their plan. A campaign in Jiangxia is a series of one-shots collected into an anthology or miniseries. Banana's background as a small box games designer shines here in Jiangshu's clear and unique objective. None of the player characters actually die. If you turn into a Jiangshu, you can turn back. The only way for the players to quote unquote lose is if they their restaurant takes on so much damage that it falls into disrepair. And then the restaurant closes because the restaurant itself actually acts as a character kind of as well. It's got eight slots on the board, and when things get covered up by undone chores, it goes into disrepair. Using this restaurant board, you go about your day using the day cycles and like the night cycles. So in the daytime, you're acting out the day scenes. You have to do your chores. You have to, you know, make sure that the customers are happy in the night. The Jiangshu come out and you have to defend the restaurant from these Jiangshu and also make sure that you get some rest for the next day. And every day you get a pool of dice. On the first day, maybe you have like five D8s. And the second day, as you're getting more stressed out, 1d8 gets taken out. And so you have to roll from 4d8s, a pool of 4d8s. And then the next day, you have 3d8s. And then finally, on the last day, maybe you have 2d8s. And that's like the least amount of d8s you can have uh, for this game. So if I were to thumbnail this, I would say in the same way that Shadowrun has a d6 dice pool, Zhangshu has a, a d8 dice pool. Yeah, and we decided to use D8s because the number eight is um, it's lucky in Chinese culture. Yeah. Um, so it's very thematic. And um, if you roll any fours, the fours cancel out the highest number because the number four is bad luck. I'm similar to the word death. So that's why we decided to have the fours be like, you know, the number that cancels out the highest number. And then the next highest number would be the outcome to the roll. In Mandarin, it would be e r san shi. Uh, and so in Cantonese, uh, because my Mandarin is terrible, in Cantonese, the number four would sound like say. And to die is say. So for Cantonese, the word zhang shi would be gong si. It would be different from say and say. So, yeah. <laughs> when you say Chinatown, are you thinking of one Chinatown in particular? So the base game is actually in, it's based off of San Francisco's Chinatown, because that's one of the first Chinatowns that, that happened during the, I believe, like the 1800s. But uh, we have a few different Chinatowns that players can choose from and a few different adventures as well. So they ne don't necessarily have to be in a Chinatown. So we have San Francisco and Los Angeles by Ross Chung. He's doing both of those. And then we have New York by Kiana Shaw, and we have Vancouver and Toronto by Daniel Kwan. Amazing. So that's five, five Chinatowns that you can choose from. But also with the adventures, if you are, say, uh, playing a, an adventure from Yoshi Creelman, uh, Yoshi Creelman's writing one on a Japanese internment camp, so using that as a setting. Uh, we also have Carl Pierre Lewis, who's using a setting that's based off of a uh, mm. Haitian American community. Wow. Yeah, so there's a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in this moment, everything that we've done mm. the session zero, we've set up the board, we've rolled out these character sheets. Uh, in this moment, what do you want people to be feeling? So there are uh, two different tones that we have set up for this game. So the first tone that we're taking on is a more serious, scary, you know, creepy vibe, sort of similar to, you know, the terror season two. It's like a weird, creepy, like what's going on type of ghost story. And then the other vibe is a sillier vibe, which is something that is used a lot in Cantonese horror movies. <laughs> For example, The Spooky Bunch is one of the movies that I've talked about before, where the characters are in like a pretty silly situation, even though they're faced with ghosts. Um, and if you've never seen The Spooky Bunch, uh, first of all, do definitely check it out. <laughs> and then <laughs> second of all, I like to think of it sort of like a Bob's Burgers meets vampires type scenario. <laughs> all right. Well, it's on the list. The Zhangshu are exactly the kind of monster I was hoping to find when I started this project. A way of understanding and interacting with important issues that fosters real conversation and community. The Zhangshu are, they're a manifestation of the, the racism and the oppression and all the, the things that the characters at the time were dealing with. So the Chinese immigrant family, they were dealing with like a lot of 
uh, a lot of stress from all these different systemic issues. And Sen and I were hoping that the junction would be like this, um, this physical manifestation of all of these things. Uh, but it's not just, uh, it's not just the scary stuff, right? Um, it's also like the silly stuff, which we tried to make light of, not in the sense that we're trying to dampen it or anything, but trying to make it feel a little more hopeful so that it's family friendly and it's a little more approachable. So when we're talking about racism or, you know, oppression, it's a little easier to understand when players try to grapple with these with these sensitive topics. I mean, I'd never ask you to write an essay about whether racism is a zombie, but I might play this game with you and ask, is racism a zombie, though? And you'd know exactly what I was talking about. What is doing it in this way add to the conversation? I think that there are two things, right? So because it's set in the 1920s, we do have a little bit of separation in terms of time and period. So because it's something that's already happened, you can sort of take a look at all this, the stuff that's happened historically, like in books or in the text itself. Um, the timeline describes like all the, the things that have happened, including like the Chinese Exclusion Act. I think that that separation with the time period allows for, for people to digest it a little easier. And then the second way is that we added these horror elements because, or quote unquote horror, they can be silly if you want them to be silly, Mm -hmm. but we add the horror element because that adds another layer of separation where it's like, okay, you know, I understand that all this stuff is happening, but it still feels like we're building a story together. We're, you know, sort of like watching a movie. We're not actually encountering these things in real life, even though we are like, we still are encountering like, you know, impression or, you know, systemic racism. We still have a safe space to sort of play in and understand more about what's happening in the world. Banana, I'm so glad you came on the podcast. (laughs) This is exactly the kind of thing I was hoping to get to. I knew it was there. I knew it was. I'm glad. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if you're as excited as I am about Zhang Shu, Blood in the Banquet Hall, you can find links to everything you need to know at the episode page on scintilla.studio slash monster, including beautiful illustrations and full-color cover art. Banana has also made available a nine-page short story written in the Chinatown setting of Zhang Shu and in the style of an actual play podcast, and you can get it by trusting me with your email address. There's going to be a lot more extras like this as Making a Monster progresses, and I'm excited to share them with you that way. Zhang Shu Blood in the Banquet Hall is live on Kickstarter until Thursday, August 13th, and a backer kit will be available on that page for late pledges. If you're also listening to this in the future, follow Wet Ink Games and Game in a Curry on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay completely up to date on the game's retail distribution. Right now, John Should Blow in the Banquet Hall will be on Kickstarter on July 14th. It's going to be a 30-day Kickstarter. I think it ends on August 13th, but afterwards, once production goes out and everything, we should be able to get in stores through distribution, as long as everything is fine, you know, like, as long as COVID doesn't mess things up some more. (laughs) Right. All those links are on the show's website at scintilla.studio slash monster. Making a Monster is produced by me, Lucas Zellers, and if you want to support the show, the best thing to do right now is rate and review the podcast wherever you happen to be listening. It really helps other listeners trust me and take a chance on this show. Next time on Making a Monster. I started my D&D design process on a series of adventures called The Air of Orcus. I wanted to make a villain who doesn't put out a ton of damage. She's not super beefy, but... She takes allies. She'll take your group of characters. If you come into her lair, five heroes, she's going to turn some of them against the party.